for those that thought that lawyers are going to be soon replaced by AI robots, by some generative AI tools, by digital twins, you're in for a surprise. Actually, we have the exact opposite situation. We have so many companies that are at risk of being sued because of their AI practices that is not even a joke. From large to medium to small size companies, this is a very important topic. And we will be discussing it today with one of the best tech lawyers that is in the space to protect you from being sued. So today with us, I have a good friend, Caroline Hughes, who is a UK-based lawyer who specializes in technology and now AI, and we'll have the opportunity to discuss her fantastic background. Welcome, my friend, uh, Caroline. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Effie. Lovely to see you. Yeah. So currently, you are focused on these issues around AI and the risks that businesses of all sizes are running. And I want to start right with how are you seeing at a 35,000 foot level the situation in financial services? How much at risk or blinded are they from these shiny new tools that promise to, to fix everything from burnout to you know 10x productivity to i don't know what i mean i'm hearing now that maybe the the first uh, trillion dollar company with one person will be around so there's a lot of excitement there's a lot of excitement there is a lot of what i call kind of shiny new toy syndrome that we're seeing amongst companies and it's it's not just financial services it's everyone i went to an interesting presentation actually recently by morgan stanley where they were talking about the key themes they're seeing around ai and they phrased it very well they said if 2023 was the year of awareness the year that it seemed like the whole world suddenly had heard of chat gpt and was suddenly interested in generative ai then 2024 feels like it's the year of adoption and we're seeing that, I think, across the board from startups to SMEs to corporates. I think it's kind of top of agenda for most CEOs. I think they're, they're putting the fear of God into their CTOs and product managers saying, we need to be using AI. We're going to get left behind if we don't. What are we doing about it? But at the same time, what we're very much seeing in practice is that I saw a recent report by Boston Consulting Group, and they say that whilst 95% of companies are looking at using AI, so they're exploring it, 71% of companies are only doing experimentation. So they're only doing behind the scenes, small scale pilots, testing, trying to figure out their use cases. Very, very few companies yet, and this is especially true in the financial services sector, very few are putting things into production. Yeah, and when you say AI, because obviously it's such a broad space and it's not a space that was born yesterday, right? We are mainly talking about the generative AI, new tools, the large language models, correct? Exactly. So we are. So this really is where the explosion, because you're you're absolutely correct. You know, AI, machine learning, deep learning have been used within companies for decades. You know, and if we think about a lot of financial services companies, they are using a lot of these models already. It's embedded within their technology stacks. But the real leap has come in the last couple of years with generative AI and the fact that we now have these foundational models that can be deployed very rapidly. They have many different use cases and they've just kind of got out into the general public awareness such that most companies now are looking at how do we deploy these in some way for our business. And the main use cases that we're seeing are chatbots on one side, you know, public facing chatbots, but increasingly where companies are looking is 
but the amount of unstructured data they have within their organizations and can that be used more effectively to do a lot of the tasks that will otherwise be done fairly manually by humans. So we're still talking about the need to prepare the data to do whatever needs to be done. Can you tell us where you see the risks that are ignored, not intentionally necessarily, or are not taken into consideration or are not in the radar screen of a lot of companies when they're looking at designing a roadmap that they're pilots? So it's interesting because companies either fall on one or other side of the spectrum. They're either very aware of the risks, which therefore means they feel paralyzed to do anything, or they are less aware of the risks and see only the commercial benefits and rush into building things and then find themselves in hot water. And I think the latter one typically happens where they are just using public facing LLM. So they're using a chat GPT or they're building a custom GPT or they're using, you know, some some of OpenAI's or Anthropic's technology and building on top of that and just kind of taking what they feel is off the shelf software and using it within their business. They are unaware of a lot of the risks that come with it. So the kind of the primary risks fall into a few categories. Data privacy is a huge risk. And you mentioned the, the contact center example. And I think that's a really, really good example because although that is an internal use case, so effectively, you're talking about call center agents using AI to effectively filter and sort inquiries coming in and then be able to deliver the advice and the responses back to those inquiries quicker, cheaper, et cetera. Yeah, and but, they upgrade themselves in terms of their knowledge in a fast and efficient way. Exactly, right? You have this huge bank of knowledge within the organization about how to answer the questions and you can you can get to those answers much quicker, much more effectively. And, in theory, more consistently, right? So that's what it promises. One of the challenges is if you are putting any personal data, so for example, if you're getting customer information, it might just be name, email address, phone number, whatever it might be, and you are putting that into any sort of public facing or so if you're building on a custom GPT on top of chat GPT, and that is a public LLM, you are actively running the risk of breaching data protection rules. And one of the reasons, and even if you have your own internal, your own internal models that you are using, just the fact of you using AI in this way to process personal data, you have to be incredibly careful about how you do it. Because under UK GDPR and EU GDPR in particular, which are kind of the gold standard for data privacy rules across the globe, they look at AI and they say just the use of AI is one of those high risk activities. And the reason for that is that most AI is effectively a black box. You, By its very nature, you do not know what is happening within the black box. You put the data in and you get the output spat out. You, But it doesn't have that built in transparency that data protection laws require. So any time that you are using AI and putting personal data into it, you have to go through a full audit process where you are analyzing that data processing and making sure that you are compliant. So it is a proper project. And I think a lot of companies probably haven't taken all of the compliance steps that they need. So data privacy is huge. And I think the next one down then is just general data security. And by that, what we're talking about is, well, we've had examples already. Um, Samsung was one where they put an absolute ban on anybody within their organization using any of the public facing LLMs. And that was because they found that some of their teams inadvertently were putting confidential or proprietary information into it, you know, to get a good summary or to write a better sales report or whatever it might be. But the risk of data leakage is there because if you are into a large language model, you do not necessarily have the security that that stays with you. And it doesn't just become part of the overall source material that could then be retrieved by somebody else using it. So data leakage is a big problem. And I guess a lot of the big tech companies are trying to offer services to protect companies 
around this issue, selling cloud secure services where everything happens within that secure part? Yes. So what we're starting to see, so if, if we think about the enterprise level, quite rightly, people are wanting to ensure that they don't have the data security issues, they don't have the data leakage issues, that they effectively have as safe a technology stack as possible when they're using AI. So what does that mean for a lot of corporates? It means that they are using their own models. So if we look back sort of a year ago, when we look at just the functionality uh, of the what we call kind of the public LLMs, which is the ChatGPT, OpenAI's, you know, Anthropic, et cetera, they very much from a performance basis were magnitude better in terms of how they operated compared to the open source models that are available. But what we've seen over time is that the open source models have improved. So now there isn't such a huge gap between how good public ones are, you know, ChatGPT4 versus some of the open source ones. So what we're starting to see is that particularly enterprise level corporates want to have their own models trained on their own data. And they want to have that on GPUs, on servers, either on premises. So what we're seeing is a lot of great startups and others now who are specifically building the server side technology so that it is easy for you know, financial services companies and other corporates who have this higher regulatory compliance burden and also just want to make sure they've got as much security as possible to be able to effectively house the whole stack either on premises or within their own virtual private cloud so that they're minimizing some of these risks and we're seeing that if they put that stack together companies are much more likely to want to actually put some of these use cases into production. It, isn't it interesting? It's as if we're going a step back, right? Yes. Uh, On-prem and private uh, virtual exactly. clouds that is needed for these advanced computing, a new hardware that has built-in software, essentially, to to run these. And I can imagine both the financial services and the health care industry which are the ones that have the, the most privacy and, and regulatory issues than any other company, whether we're talking within the EU or outside. Caroline, you have been an entrepreneur. You were uh, the founder of WealthTech Lifestyle. So you have rolled up your sleeves. You have built a, a startup. You're also involved in the startup community and and please tell us a little bit more about your activities with um, the Hive uh, founders and how that experience is helping you understand the, the issues, not at the theoretical level, but really at the practical level to help clients. Yes, I think I have occupied quite a unique, I feel quite privileged now to be in this position as we kind of got this new technological wave, because I don't think there are that many lawyers who have also built with AI actually, you know, from the ground up. So, you know, with LifeTies, we use a lot of machine learning within the platform. So very heavily involved in designing that from the very beginning. And that was all about helping consumers predict outcomes of financial decisions that they made. So again, very, very practical use case for AI. And that was actually before we had all of the LLMs. It would have made it much easier to build, actually, had we had some of this technology yeah. already out. But then even after Lifetize, like I, I, I'm very much a builder. I like to understand exactly how the technology works that I'm going to be talking to clients about. So when Stable Diffusion first launched, I created a tool that would generate headshots, so professional headshots for all people like me who hate going to the photographer to get corporate headshots. So we created a tool that allowed you to input a number of your own photos, and then it would output professional looking headshots for you. And what was fascinating about building that was it both showed me how good the image generators could be, but also critically the constraints of it. 
And those constraints were kind of twofold. What we actually found was as the model itself theoretically improved and it went through the different versions, actually the outputs got. And the reason for that is because it's trained on so many billions of different images. But when you're asking it to generate an image of you based on photos, it is using your photos, but also composites of all of the other training data. So it actually makes it very, very difficult to get a very accurate image mm. of you. It sort of is like you and also not like you. And this has been incredibly helpful for me because a lot of my clients now are advertising agencies, creative and media agencies looking at how do they use things like Stable Diffusion, how do they use Mid Journey as part of their workflows for generating creative output for clients, right? For brands. And having that knowledge of actually how to build it, what the quality of the output is, what the constraints are, what additional technology you would need in order to be able to get the level of quality, and also understanding the underlying copyright issues yeah. has been extremely helpful to be able to steer clients on what they can be using, what they shouldn't be using, how to make sure they've got the right licenses in place, what their client contracts now need to look like. So I feel quite lucky that I've actually been both a builder and, and an advisor. And it's, you know, to talk about kind of my experience with, with Hive. So, you know, Hive is a global accelerator and network for female founders, and we have a lot of founders building in AI. But what's interesting is we typically have founders building at the more foundational level where they are building things which genuinely have a use case. And this is what we advise because you know we talk to a lot of VCs within our network. And what we're seeing is there is an appetite for what we would call perhaps kind of true AI, which is at that foundational level or which has use cases where you are either solving for a very, very niche segment and a very very specific problem but what we're not seeing a lot of appetite for in terms in investment terms is just general applications built on top of generative ai because they are in my own experience very very quick to build you have almost no competitive moat because yeah. anybody else could could come and do it so that application layer, I absolutely agree with you, that application layer is not really where the value is. The value comes from, and I think this is what we're going to see increasingly, existing companies that already have valuable data to do valuable tasks better, but which actually generate new lines of revenue for them. So again, what we're seeing on the investment side and the signals kind of from the market is there's not a huge amount of excitement around initiatives within organizations that just potentially save them money mm. because that is a use case that needs to be proved over time so the market is less interested in that but what the market is interested in are those use cases where using ai actually either unlocks a whole new revenue stream for the company or creates this incredible feedback loop for their existing product where the AI unlocks some data points, it then gets kind of pushed around customers who then with the data that they produce feeds back into the AI model to make that even better. And you create this virtuous loop using AI to it just wheel. continuously improve your data within the business and then deliver more value back to customers. That's really what we're seeing is the kind of the things that get investors excited. Caroline, does it mean that we're looking for use cases where we're breaking silos in a way and creating new value in the process of breaking these uh, silos. Very much so. It is, it's all about unlocking the value of data within organizations. So when we're talking to particularly the solution providers who are building AI solutions within companies, the biggest kind of signal that we're seeing is that everybody wants to build rags. So it is the retrieval piece. It is taking, they're going in and they're having to do a lot of consultative work with companies. But they're going in and they're talking to different departments about what data do you capture 
and helping them understand how RAG can effectively pull that data, synthesize it, potentially combine it with data from other departments, as you say, because it's all in silos. Yeah. And then identify where that data could be used to either improve efficiency, but more often to create new products. Is that where the new tech architecture is going and all the LLMs will be RAG LLMs? Basically, RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. It's a way, it's effectively a way for you to be able to query your own data. So if you think about that call center example that you had before, yeah. so if you think about the knowledge banks and the way that call center agents are taught to answer questions, they will typically have either scripts they work from or yeah. they will have a knowledge bank. So if the um, customer asks a question that is outside of the generic script, and we all get very frustrated with call center agents because we know that they're working to the script and we often can't get at the answer that we want, but it's a way to be able to query that knowledge database in a way that gives consistently fast, accurate answers that the agent can then deliver to the customer, that is what you would use RAG for because you're retrieving that data. So that's a very kind of simple example. But where you look at it across organizations is exactly what you've talked about is so many organizations and financial services, I think, are one of the worst offenders for this, that everything is very, very siloed. And of course, they have legacy systems that they're dealing with, which often keeps data stored in siloed um, pieces of the, of the network. What you have the ability to do with AI is to be able to pull different data sources and then be able to query it in such a way that you can now come up with new combinations of things that perhaps the humans who are stuck in their silos in their departments wouldn't yeah. necessarily have thought of. And Go, that's the exciting thing. Going back to, to what you were trying to build at the Lifetiles, but essentially it, this could enable us to have a holistic view of the financial, current financial situation of the customer, their financial history behaviorally, and then use that to make some more insightful predictions or scenario analysis or advice based on that because today you can't see that exactly that's exactly it you know i was always fascinated to understand how banks and other financial services organizations used ai within kind of things around decisioning and sort of financial advice and actually from my perspective, it was a very, quite a rudimentary way of using it in the sense that it was very much sort of like a, just a, a workflow of, you know, almost like sort of a waterfall thing where it would be yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, this way. But as you say, no ability to see that holistic picture. And open banking unlocks part of that in that ability to be able to, because if you're a bank and you only have certain information about the customer because you hold have yeah. their current account, but you don't know if they've got loans elsewhere, credit cards elsewhere, what yeah. their investments yeah. look like, you didn't have that visibility before. So open banking gave us kind of that first step. But what is in have, the process is in the process, right? <laughs> that is, it's still, it's, it, it gives us the ability potentially to do that. It hasn't come to fruition yet. But what we have now is, as you say, this ability to take a much broader set of data and now to be able to bring that back together in a way that we couldn't do before because we're taking different disparate parts. Some of it might be unstructured, some of it might be structured, and now being able to pull that together, to query it, to be able to synthesize it better, and as you say, then to be able to make decisions and recommendations on the back of it. I still think we're some way off that because there needs to be the appetites to do it. And when you're talking about organizations, as we say, that have legacy systems, it will take time, I believe. But the it first ones that time, do it will but, get an advantage. But, but here again is another irony that big organizations, big banks, the JP Morgans of the world have a huge advantage here because they are, you know, they in theory, have a 300 view of, of the customer. Although 
I'm rethinking what I said <laughs> because, because yes, they do on the one hand and on the other hand, because of FinTech, a lot of us have multiple providers, right? We have five or six consumer banking providers and, you know, two or three or even more in the, the investment space and so on. So maybe that fragmentation won't be uh, overcome soon. Uh, and I think that's right. Yeah. I think it's very hard for a single banking institution to be able to get all of that data whether we will start to see more super apps doing it you know sitting as a, what what lifetimes was always intended to be which was sitting as that layer on top that could join all of the dots but was independent from each of the institutions um but it will be very interesting to see and it will be interesting to see whether consumer appetite for having things in one place increases once we start to see some of the use cases come through, right? Whether it will be driven by consumer demand or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other topic that we could have a discussion, which is the topic of how will open banking be reshaped because yes. of these large language models and, and what will be the interactivity between these two technologies and how they're going to shape business models and consumer yes services but we don't want to go there i want to go <laughs> back and ask you do you have a qr code that your clients your enterprise your corporate clients can scan and get a menu where they here is a list of half a dozen ways that one can get sued because of ai and then you give it to them you tell them look go back home study this come back Let's have a discussion. No, but I need to. What we've created, you'll, you might have seen some of my LinkedIn posts that have got some traction because of using exactly headlines like, here, here are the top five ways that you can get sued for AI right now. It's an ever-increasing list is the answer. Yes. So, that, so, is... so really tell us what are the top ways. And again, these are not theoretical. They're coming from, you know, your experience, your customers, your prospects, what you're seeing and hearing in the market. They are very real. They are not going anywhere and they are going to become more. So, so there's some interesting ones. Let's give some specific ones around because it might prompt people to think about what they're actually using. So chatbots going rogue is always a good one because from a reputational perspective, it can be quite catastrophic. So what we are seeing is people coming to clients, coming to us and saying, we want to set our new chatbots live, but we don't want to do a DPD. And what they're referring to there is the logistics company DPD had a chatbot on its website that started abusing and swearing at customers when it didn't like what they said. And again, what's been interesting there is that is much more of a reputational risk, right? So when we talk about things, we're talking about both compliance risk, but also reputational risk. And it's anything, anytime you put any, anything public, that is what you are worried about. So what we are now starting to see again, because I'm always interested in who's solving for these issues. We're now starting to see some interesting technology come out where you have the ability to get some transparency behind your chatbot. So to understand how your chatbot is actually thinking through the queries and the Q&A that it is giving. And I think, again, we're going to see more of this. So it allows companies, both when they're building their chatbots and, and putting the Q&A structure together, but also then to be able to interrogate and properly do quality assurance testing yeah. on their chatbots whilst they're live and then you know continuously to make sure that they don't go rogue. Is this improving the explainability of the model or is it more putting some borders on the parameters? You can't call people yeah. these names or, yes. you know. It's both, right? It's Yeah, so those parameters that you just mentioned are typically called guardrails, right? Yeah. So it's making sure you have the right guardrails for whatever your model is, for your bot. But it's also about... You know, if you think about what most bots that are out right now are designed to do, and again, it's around kind of the customer service piece, yeah. but 
Another example of one which actually kind of went to court was Air Canada. So Air Canada had a chatbot, but you've probably seen it. Somebody queried it and said they'd had a bereavement. Could they get a refund? The chatbot said, yes, sure. But that was actually against the company policy. And so, but the person who had screenshotted it, and again, consumers are going to become very savvy. They're going to start screenshotting all of their interactions with your bots. You've got to expect that. And the court there held that if a chatbot is essentially part of your organization, what Air Canada tried to argue was that the chatbot was external to them. I mean, it's a nice argument, but it's it's not going to fly because they said, well, we can't, we don't know exactly how it's going to answer. That's not going to work either. You're going to have an obligation as the organization that owns the chatbot and puts it out there. But whatever the answers are given, you're going to have to stand behind them. So this ability to therefore be able to interrogate your bot and to really test it and to understand what it is likely to answer is going to be ever more critical because when it's giving answers which have any kind of contractual benefits to them, they're going to apply. You're not going to be able to get away with saying, sorry, it wasn't us, it was the bot. Bot went rogue, it wasn't us. So so those are two uh, chatbot ways to get sued. What are other ways? So one that I think has gone completely under the radar for most organizations, because I can guarantee that most organizations that have over 150 employees are probably using this, is the AI that is increasingly being used in applicant tracking software for recruitment. And there's a couple of things here. So basic applicant tracking software just uses keywords to sift through applicant CVs, resumes, and to be able to kind of decide who gets into the interview pile, right? Let's put yes. it like that. We do make sure. But, yes. Exactly, to make sure this. But increasingly, as the ATS software becomes more sophisticated, it's doing more than that. It's either going out and looking at people's LinkedIn profiles and potentially other information about them to source candidate calls. So that's typically kind of at the higher end of the market. So it's effectively doing more of the job of a headhunter, you know, so executive search, but it's compiling data about potential candidates from multiple sources of information and then pulling that together and then sifting through. But the challenge there, again, is that some of the early cases that are coming through are evidencing signs of discrimination mm. built into these models, right? So some examples have been where the language and what it tries to do, the ATS, is obviously it takes the job specification and how that has been described, and then it identifies who it thinks is the, are the right candidates. So it does that kind of pattern matching process. But of course, when you're doing pattern matching, you really have to make sure that the rules for the pattern matching are not discriminatory. Yeah. And what has been seen is that some of the language that is used in job descriptions, the results that the AI ATS has, has picked is that certain language it determines skews towards male candidates yeah. because it feels that they are power words or things around sort of leadership courage, things like that, it has determined that those are more male characteristics and therefore it selects it's either majority or third, almost exclusively yeah. male yeah. candidates. And similarly, some of the software has been found to discriminate against, for example, names or universities or schools and things which are indicative of people who come from a minority ethnic background. Yeah. And that is a real problem for companies because, again, particularly in the UK and the EU, where we have very, very strong anti-discrimination laws, okay. you could potentially find yourself in hot water for using a system or a tool yes, that yes. actually has built-in biases that you may never be aware of, right, because it's deep in the algorithm. But the effect is the same. The in, the output the of this is process the is the same. And I think that is one that has very much gone under the radar because those who are kind of doing the recruitment are not themselves discriminating 
but at those that kind of early sifting stage for resumes are very much relying on this software yeah. but it potentially has the ability to be discriminatory and i imagine it would take some not entry level candidates to sue these companies but a rather more advanced candidate to build a case which is not easy too, right? Again, it's not easy, but interestingly, you know, particularly in countries where you have very strong kind of employment laws, often it shifts the burden to the organization to show that they have not discriminated. And that becomes very challenging. Again, if we think about AI in this way as often that black box, you are not necessarily able to explain how the algorithms work. And therefore, from a sort of audit perspective or a compliance perspective, it becomes hard for you to show that the software you have used is not yeah. discriminated. So we always recommend, you know, make sure that there are humans in the process that are sense checking what the AI is doing. You know, it's, it's super helpful from an efficiency perspective, but you need to have humans in the process to make sure to, again, act as those guardrails around just to be aware of these potential pitfalls. I mean, Caroline, we, we could be talking uh, for hours on these topics. I want, before we close, to ask you a sensitive question, as personally, I really can't get over this incident of the Sora CTO, which is also a woman, um, that was interviewed and was asked about what was the data used to train Sora, which is really very impressive, at least what's been floating around on, on the, was uh, saying, I don't know, and I can talk about this and something about YouTube. And now I see the YouTube CEO coming out and saying, if it was actually trained <laughs> on YouTube, this is a violation. Give us your sense on this situation. That you're you know, the, 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 you know, if we think about the the single biggest kind of legal issue that has come out so far with the LLMs, it is this idea of copyright infringement. Right, so this idea that that what has ChatGPT, Claude, Stability, etc., been trained on? Right, the billions of words, images, videos that have to go in as the training data for it to be able to, for these LLMs to be able to do what they do. So when we see all of these copyright infringement cases from you know, Getty Images, the New York Times, you know, there's ever, ever more and more and more copyright infringement claims coming out. So there's a lot of all of the music artists now coming out and saying that all their music and their lyrics have been copyright infringed. So the lawyer in me, when I saw, saw a CTO's interview with the Wall Street Journal, the lawyer in me said, OK, she's actually been well trained by her lawyers to give a no comment answer here because there is no answer that she could give here that would not get her in hot water. So the lawyer in me completely understood why she would give an evasive answer to the question, what has Sora's video oh, no. oh, and no. been, been trained on? <laughs> But she seemed a bit surprised and uncomfortable. She was not cool in saying, as if she wasn't prepared. Yes, I know. So what the answer should have been was, oh, I cannot talk about that because there, obviously you'd be aware that there is current litigation on this point, so I'm not allowed to talk, right? That would have been a better because it shuts it down. Instead, unfortunately, it made it look like either she didn't know or that she was deliberately just trying to completely avoid the topic. I think there is, there's no way around it. And I, I actually think they're not disputing the fact that they have used some copyright work. They are open to the fact that copyright material has been used in the training process. Where it becomes interesting from a legal perspective is the fact that from an open AI and the other's perspective, their argument is that they have fair use. They have the right to use all of this copyright material to train their models. And that is not copyright infringement. And that is really where, particularly in the US, this legal issue is going to be resolved. And it's going to be fascinating. And actually, some of the more interest, anyone sort of geek on this stuff, 
the more interesting stuff are the arguments that particularly like the New York Times and others are raising where they're saying, fine, you can have fair use across most work, but actually what you've done in these models is give additional weighting to source material that comes from organizations like ours because you rank it higher and you give it more weight within the model compared to just any old data that comes from anywhere. So if you give it more weight, uh, then that means fair. that actually it's not fair use. It because is. And there's some really fascinating arguments coming in. So like I say, if anyone's kind of a geek around this, dig in to some of the arguments being run. But it will all come down to whether, and I think some of this is not just going to be a pure legal issue in terms of how it gets decided. I think there's some political lobbying, all of that kind of stuff around will they decide that it effectively counts as fair use because they believe that the benefits of having this technology outweigh the copyright Operation. issues yes, yes. but it does like i you know again anyone who's interested I, i'm i'm sort of writing a whole series of linkedin posts around copyright because i think it is such a interesting topic here because is almost getting to the point where if there aren't some checks and balances, copyright could potentially become redundant in the age of AI. You know, IP rights change dramatically in the age of AI, and we're only just starting to see how that applies. It's extremely interesting how the, the technologies, of course, are shaping our, our social online behavior, but now we're talking about shaping also legal concepts and evolving the way we think what we value and how we value it even in exactly. legal contracts and yeah. that's interesting caroline thank you so much that was a wonderful insightful discussion and i will be sharing with the audience your linkedin profile so they can follow you as you share insights on this amazing topic thanks so much for having me effie it's been you. wonderful